ball so hard, this shit crazy. Y'all don't know that don't shit face. And that's we go, oh, for 82, when I look at you like you the gravy. Ball so hard, where? We ain't even po be here. Ball so hard, since we here. It's only right that we be fair. Psycho, I'm libo, to go Michael. Take the pick, Jackson, Tyson, Jordan, game six. What up, what up, everybody? This is Double G for the third edition of Ball So Hard, of the Ball So Hard podcast. And my special guest today is someone who I've known for a little while. I've known him as a completely different name than how most people know him <laughs> today. I know him as Twitch, but he is Nick James, and he is on ESPN 630, uh, radio host doing uh, sports talk. And uh, how's it going, man? I'm doing well, man. Uh, it's been a while. How's everything going with you? Ah, uh, things are great. Um, the, the the so the reason uh, the the way that I know you, and and we'll sort of get that out of the way, is uh, <laughs> of course um, my good friend, young Randall Bartholomew. He was your basketball coach at some point. Quite, and, quite uh, some time ago, yeah. <laughs> And so that's how that's how I, I know you. Uh, we we played ball a couple times and and all that. And then you know, lo and behold, here it is. And you know, two thousand. When did you get the radio job? Two thousand thirteen. Two thousand thirteen. Second half of two thousand thirteen. Yeah. Two thousand and thirteen. And I hear that you are doing sports radio, which is near and dear to my heart, based on where I started. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so you know, outside of our our casual Twitter conversations about basketball mostly uh you know now we have something else in common which is uh your sports radio gig you know i i i went into that genre gosh now it's like 15 years ago or something like that um you know when i interned at cambr and saw all the inner workings of of that and and got to work with guys who are still on radio today like chris townsend um larry krueger Bob Fitzgerald, Tom Tolbert. So all of those guys are still around and uh, still doing their thing. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in your gig and, and how it all happened. So uh, I guess to kick this thing off, um, how did it all start for you? Because, I, I you know, I, 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 so I, I won't say that I know you extremely well, but not once did a, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing sports radio ever kind of come into our conversation. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, so I, I've, I've lived in San Jose a good portion of my life, and I was up there just bartending. I uh, got a degree at San Jose State, and I was just kind of floating around really doing, you know, nothing outside of just making a paycheck and, and all that and whatnot. Um, my wife has a ton of family down here in uh, Monterey County, so we moved down this way to be closer to our family, and I started substitute teaching with my degree. And I'm rarely awake before 11 o'clock at this point in my life, like rarely awake before 11 o'clock. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I started subbing, so I had to be up a little earlier, and I'm cruising to work one day, listening to sports radio, and there's an ad saying, we're looking for the next you know, sports radio host on here on ESPN 630. Um, and, I, you know, just the boom, the bubble went off in my head. I'm like, dude, I should at least try out what's the worst thing that could happen. And uh, I called my wife when I got to the school that day um, to teach, and I was like, you know, what do you think? She's like, oh, go for it. She was, like, totally 100% behind it. So um, I submitted a video. I made the finals. And then um, right after the finals, they gave me a call back. Went did a couple more interviews. Lo and behold, I get the job. So no experience, no idea how the radio stuff works. I've learned way more inside about the radio than uh I would have ever guessed or known. Um, it, it was pretty funny some of the stuff you learn about radio being in the business, but uh, I've been taking a crash course since the end of October, really, and uh, it's been a blast. But uh, it's a lot of work, man. You know, I do everything from uh, sales to creating content to, uh, you know, actually, you know, actually making the show, and then, you know, I'm the producer of the show, so. Uh, I'm wearing a lot of hats at once, but it's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, I mean, dude, I would, I spend a majority of my time, you know, shooting the shit about sports anyway. So now at least I get paid for it. So I guess it all works out. Please don't tell me you have to screen your own calls. That is the biggest issue with my show. Is that <laughs> <laughs> I have to answer. If I take calls, I have to answer them live on air and you get some knuckleheads. So there's like, 
you know, it's it's dicey when we take calls. To be honest with you, I'm not a. I try to get interviews because, man, I'm I'm working a solo two hour show. I'm the only dude in the studio. I'm usually the only dude in the building. To be honest, the, so the, that that's that's the toughest part. Yeah, man, you need an intern or something who can at least answer the calls and maybe uh, cut cut some sound for you so you could, that you could use during the show. I have to. I do all that beforehand. You know, the the funny thing is that we have some interns, and I, I hope they don't you know get mad when I say this, but they're very nice people, very intelligent people, but they don't come from a sports background. So I'm having a hard time, uh, you know, trying to show them how the equipment works. And in addition, try to get them to understand what we're actually talking about on the show. So it's been a little bit of an issue, uh, a little bit, a little bit of a hurdle to get over. Well, uh, when I, when I was, when I was working there, uh, at KMBR, I remember, um, Pat Olson was kind of the guy who was running the show. I don't, I don't actually don't know what he's doing these days, but um, he, he was telling me that uh, you know the intern program was you know obviously those, those things that I just said you need guys to do. That's you know that's kind of what I was doing, kind of assistant producing here and there. But he told me that you know just don't be one of those guys who is supposed to be cutting tape and instead is like you know writing copy and and trying to practice your radio voice he's like you got to move like you got you got to be doing yeah. stuff so that that was uh that that was my uh that that was his insight there but um so let's go back to this this contest now when you when i first heard about this like in the back of my head i was thinking like oh like this radio station is looking for new talent new blood maybe they did some sort of like american idol for for sports broadcasting <laughs> or something like but it doesn't sound like it was you know anything that they did that they, you know, maybe they even promoted outside of what you had heard. Like, what was the process in actually, you know, getting involved in that? And like you, you mentioned, you know, making the final cuts. Like, how many people were there actually to go through to in order to get there? Um, I don't know how many people submitted videos. That I couldn't tell you. I, I haven't even found that out in the time I've been working there. But once I got there, I was, you know, more concerned with trying to figure out how to make a a show work. But um, yes, you had to submit a video. Um, you know, of yourself talking about sports in some way or another. And, and the hot button for me at the time was, you know, I, I'm a big Niners fan, so everybody was on the, you know, uh, it was when the Niners were, weren't doing so well at the beginning of last year, and everybody was on the, oh, if we stunned Alex Smith, we wouldn't be 1-2, and two, we'd be 3-0, and oh, blah, 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 that crap. So and that was what I used as the basis of my, my interview, I mean, my, my video that I made. So I submitted the video. They gave me a call back. At the final, I believe eight people um, we're in the final. Uh, to be completely honest with you, Gigi, I only thought that three of them, myself being one of the three, were even viable. To be completely honest with you, five of them, I was just like, wow, how bad were the people that didn't make the final? <laughs> I'll be really, really honest with you, man. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we got there. There was eight. Uh, I was like the second one to go. And the guy before me, fortunately, because it really eased my nerves, was real bad. You know what I mean? So I'm like, dude, I can't do any worse than that. Yeah. <laughs> no offense No offense to the guy who went before me. I don't recall <laughs> his name. But, uh, you know, I mean, I was like, you know, as long as I don't really have to stop, I can walk away with my dignity. Um, we had to do a couple of different things. First was, uh, you know, why we wanted to be in sports radio, our uh, life history, you know, in, in terms of sports, whether we played, watched, you know, wrote about them, whatever it was. And then we had to do, this was the funny one, is we had to do play-by-play of all these uh, famous sports moments. Now, we knew which ones going in, so I had done a lot of background and everything, but um, it was the catch, uh, Dwight Clark in the back of the end zone, and that one was easy because I'm a Niners fan. Yep. There was the miracle to Meadowlands because Herm Edwards works for our station, so <laughs> Herm's tied into everything that we do, it seems like. So we had to call that one. And then the toughest one, because I hate the Dodgers, was Kirk Gibson's home run in the 88 oh, World Series. And I'm sitting there trying to act like I'm excited, but I really just want to say, like, screw Kirk Gibson, screw the Dodgers. <laughs> you know I, mean? like, I, ain't having to, I ain't trying to act excited for none of that. But we had to do those three, and then they, um, and then they asked us, you know, uh, what our favorite memory of sports was, and we answered that, and then they, you know, they went from there. They gave us a call back. There was, a, you know, a couple more interviews, but uh, I think a bulk of it, from what I've been told by my boss, they knew – the day of that they liked me and as long as i wasn't crazy in other two interviews i was gonna be all right so 
Cool deal. Now, what? So, what was your your sports moment that you gave them? Uh, it's kind of uh, you're gonna, we're going to get all sappy right away. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was when I was 16, when I was a uh, sophomore in high school, my father passed away, and my father was uh, one of the biggest Giants fans I've ever met. I mean, he literally made me watch all 162 games. He was on disability before he passed. He was always home. If he ever went over in the Giants run. Uh, you know, he, he was watching him, and that was 2004. So 2010, I'm with my fiance, which is now my wife and my brother-in-law, and the Giants are taking on the Rangers. And, um, you know, Edgar Renteria hits a home run. Giants take the lead. I mean, barring an epic collapse, they're going to win the World Series. Um, and I call my mom right before the last out because I'm like, Mom, you know, the Giants are finally going to do it. We went through – so many times of, you know, the Giants failing us, whether it was, you know, 2002 World Series with the Angels, 2003 with Jose Cruz Jr. and the drop pop-up against the Marlins. I mean, I can go on and on about how many times the Giants broke my heart. So um, I call my mom like, damn, they're going to do it. And, I, and I'm telling her what's happening. And for whatever reason, my feed was about 10 seconds ahead of hers. And I just told her, I said, wow, Dad would be so happy. You know, like he... he he never saw in, you know, live or in person the Giants win the World Series. That was kind of a connection to my father when they finally won the World Series. I was like, man, Dad, Dad would be so happy, so proud. And my mom and I kind of shared that moment on the phone. That was probably my – that's one thing that always sticks to me, you know, beyond sports, that connection that really just was, you know, kind of something special for me. Yeah, I mean, that that is an awesome memory. And, and there is something about sports that – for whatever reason, genetically or just human nature, that that fathers and sons and 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 uh-huh. families in general, like you said, you talk to your mom, and I know your mom's a sports fan as well. Just if, you know, if, if sports does one thing well, it is sort of you know it bonds family. Um, so that that's yeah. a, that's a really cool moment. Um, so the uh, the you get through this whole thing and you get the job and. It's just like, okay, like, did someone teach you a crash course and what was going on? Like, how much practice did you have before you actually had to go on air? Or did they just kind of throw you into the wolves and go, okay, buddy, you know, go for it? Well, uh, we started off with, you know, I I have a a manager, uh, my program director, Bernie Moody, great guy. I've been in the radio business for quite some time, done a lot of different formats. Um. He said, first, you got to get comfortable on the mic. So I was, you know, in the production studio, and I would talk about topics for quite some time. And it's funny because you hear them back, and you're like, you know, in your mind, you thought you were doing all right. And then you hear it back, you're like, wow, you sound like an idiot. You know, you're, like, <laughs> you're so dry, and you're so boring. There's nothing going on there. Um, so it takes that time to develop. And all he told me, I swear, like, I felt like the only two things – my manager ever told me the only two things Bernie ever told me were energy, 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 and radio is a living, breathing thing. Make sure you evolve. He told me that like every single day. I felt like that was the only thing I heard for like two months. So I did about six weeks in the production room, working on that kind of stuff, learning how a board works, um, learning how to you know integrate other um, sounds and other you know clips of audio into your program. And then towards the end of October, I probably more like the beginning of December, I started doing 1 to 3 a.m. on the radio. And it's, uh, you know, it's cool because you're actually doing a real show. And it's cool because nobody's listening to you. But, man, when I heard the tapes back at some of my shows, I was like, dude, why did they hire you, man? I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was atrocious, man. I was like, <laughs> you sound like an amateur. And, you know, really, I was. I still kind of am, to be honest, but, um, you know, cause I'm still learning my way through it, but you know, those, those first couple of, uh, overnight shows were pretty rough, but then towards, I did that for, uh, until the middle of January and probably the first two weeks or the first two weeks of the new year in January, it was like, I could tell it was coming along. Like it sounded it was somewhat decent. And then, uh, right the day after the NFC championship game this year, uh, and I remember that because the Niners lost. Uh, uh, that was my first real show, three to five, and, and uh, you know it's come a long way since, man. I can say that I'm actually proud of what I do now. So, uh, give me 
Like, what do you think is the hardest part about the job? Like, is it, you know, I, like for me, like I'm trying to think back, like what, what were some of the harder things? Like, obviously, you know, interviewing is something that takes a lot of practice and a lot of reps and, you know, just talking to people and trying to sound conversational when you're trying to hit certain points. And then, you know, maybe the conversation's going somewhere like that, I think is pretty hard. Um, or, or just talking into a live mic, like how long did it take that to uh, to to get casual for you, uh, you know, talking to the live mic. I would say before, outside of my very first show, because I got kind of nervous when the mic I opened up the first time, uh, three to five p.m. But um, I would say the toughest part was making sure that in a two-hour show you're going to do a lot of talking. Um, two hours, five days a week. I mean, that's ten hours. You know, give or take commercials. I'm talking for eight hours a week. And creating the content and making it all make sense, um, it sometimes can be a little bit challenging. You have to make sure that that you follow your points. It's like writing a paper. You know, being on the radio to me sometimes is like writing a paper. You have your idea, but it has to follow a pattern and make sense. If you start bouncing around and it sounds like you're just, you know, going stream of conscious all over the place, which, you know, some, you know, when you start doing that, your your points don't become precise. Your content starts to get diluted, and then all of a sudden you're not making sense, and people don't want to listen to a guy who doesn't sound like he's making sense. So staying on point, staying on the topic, um, and making sure it follows an A to B to C and get to your conclusion. You can't go A to C and then back to B and then your conclusion. It doesn't sound right. And that was something kind of I'd struggle with at the beginning. I, I start, you know, I almost like rambling on. And then next thing you know, you don't, I, I listen back to him like, dude, you don't make it that, that, that could have been so much clearer. And your point would have been so much more well received had you followed your train of thought. You know what I mean? So sometimes that was the hardest thing for me. You're right. Right. Like sometimes I'll hear interviewers who aren't really confident in their question so they'll end up almost answering their question as they're saying it. Like uh, even uh. like even even good like good people like um, like Tom Tolbert sometimes like he's a, he's a ton better now than than you know back in the day. But he'll like he'll ask a question sometimes, and it'll be like you know maybe he's talking to you know to Mark Jackson or something about you know maybe Steph Curry's defense, and it'll be like. You know, how, how how have you seen Steph Curry's defense evolve this year? Now is it now now is he still doing X, Y, and Z, or you know is, is it is it an athletic thing? And like he just keeps going, 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 and like Mark Jackson can't really answer the question because he's already given like every. You know, and and I see that happen a lot, and I think it's kind of. You know, I think it's 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 sort of a thing that happens often, even with you know really good interviews. You don't you don't hear someone like Jim Rome, you know, who's pretty confident guy do that. But I think it, I think it happens often. Now, how, how comfortable are you with the interviewing process? Uh, just you know, talking to some of these guys who, you know, some of them I'm sure uh, it's kind of a, a little bit of a thrill, and in other cases you're interviewing people that you've never even thought about before because you know they're a high school coach or a college coach. But there is a reason to do so. Yeah, I think you know, interviewing, fortunately for me, was one of the things that came um, a little bit easier. And it's funny you mentioned Mr. T. Uh, I think you learned that interview style from the Razor back in the day because that guy would have, like, the longest-winded question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of all Ra- time. Ralph would do it often as well. <laughs> yeah, Ralph, Ralph was real bad about that. But uh, um, I, I grew up, dude, it's funny, this, it might sound funny, but I grew up in a house of women, dude. I have spend time listening because all they do is no offense to the ladies, but they talk a lot. So um, <laughs> I'm going to get killed for saying that my wife's going to hear this and kick my butt. But um, And then being like bar- Barton for six and a half years. So um, for me, I'm used to listening to people. And the biggest thing with an interview is if I interview anybody, and I've interviewed, you know, like you said, high school and junior college coaches for football and basketball, um, I've interviewed, you know, local paper guys. I've interviewed Dan Rusinowski from the Sharks. Probably the, the coolest interview I did was Jim Tunney, who's a Hall of Fame NFL. Happens to live down in um, our area, down here in Monterey. But the biggest thing is when you have them on, it's about them. It's not about you. So I'm not there to give my opinion at that time. I'm not there to 
tell them anything. I'm there to get knowledge from them. So when I ask questions, I want to keep my part short. I don't want to let them expand upon everything. So when I ask Jim Tunney, what's the hardest part about being an NFL official, I don't need to go on and on about, well, is it because the game moves so fast and athletes are so big and they, they feel so and so on and so on. I don't need to I don't need to tell him that. He'll tell me that. Let right. him expand upon that. I don't need to be the guy answering the question. That's why I have that person with me. Right. Um, no, I mean, all that is very cool. Uh, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's awesome. And I, I'm glad that you chose that route. You know, I, I, in, in my radio days, like I, I saw it as something I really enjoyed, but I also saw it as, uh, something of a, how can I say it? Uh, it's it's hard to move through the ranks you know the guys that i said that i worked with are still there today and if yeah. if we were to look at you know the rotation at KMBR and how different it was when i was there like there's very few people who are new who weren't there it's literally the uh, the morning guys it's literally uh murphy murph and mac and you know gary gary ranich is still there fitz and brooks are still there Tolbert's still there, and I guess uh, um, who does their their evenings now? I guess uh, Ray Ray. I forget his last Ray name. Wilson. Yeah, he does their their okay. their nights sometimes. Um, so you know, there's, like it's like this is 15 years later, and those are the guys who are still doing it. So I I sort of saw that like when I was there, I said okay, like this is kind of how it works, and I could stick I could stick with it and, and try to grow somewhere. More than likely, I was going to have to go to a smaller smaller market and, and do it. And I said, you know, I I I'm fine chasing another goal and then just doing this for fun. You know, when when I when I can, which actually came through podcasting. So. You know, I can do this as a hobby and have fun with it and talk to my friends and, 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 and like you uh, and get a kick out of it and put it out there for friends and family to hear. And I'm completely OK with that. But I do I do love the fact that there are still people who, you know, for whatever reason, get into the business and, and, and still have the dream of, of doing it. And, um, you know, I think I think it's really cool. Now, we'll get off the radio stuff and, and talk, you know, quick sports takes. But. Uh, do you have like a, a long term goal in in the business, or are you just you know are you taking it day by day? Like, what's your what's your thought process there? You know, obviously, long term goal would be to get into a bigger market. I'm not obviously the Salinas, Santa Cruz, Monterey market is not huge. Um, there's a certain cap on you know your reach within that one within that particular market. I mean, I'd love to do it for the rest of my life. I've been a sportsnet forever, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, it is hard, though, you know, and it's become much, much more competitive, um, especially lately with the, with the increase in sports radio, you know, stations. There's more people. They, they need more talent, but the reality is there's more and more people trying for it. Um, you know, to be honest, I, 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 if I wanted to make a career out of this, I would start in Monterey, and then I end up in some slightly bigger market, probably in the middle of nowhere, and then a slightly bigger market, and... Uh, I will continue to do this as long as I can pay my bills and, and, and feed everybody under my roof. Um, if that's if that becomes you know impossible to do, then obviously I have to go you know make a living. But uh, right now it's working out. I'm making enough money, and I'm going to keep you know grinding until I get the next opportunity. That's um, you know definitely this is definitely the career I want to have as long as it fits into everything else that I need to do on a, on a day to day basis. No, that's awesome. Uh, I, I I love following my friends who are still who are still doing it, uh, um, still in radio or TV or whatever or wherever. And you know, you see even today, you know, websites. Um, I was just talking to um, I don't know if you know him or not. I'm sure you know of him, but Steve Berman, who is the Bay Area sports guy and has his own website, he actually broke the the yeah. story that I want to talk to you about next, which is. Colin Kaepernick uh, his, <laughs> signing his extension, and what's so cool about that is he. So he 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 actually broke the story that sources say Kaepernick is going to sign an extension, you know, today, or he's signing an extension today, or whatever. You know, there wasn't really terms. I, I don't believe he had any terms. He may have had like the length or whatever. 
And like literally like three minutes later, Adam Schefter hits the the terms of it looks like it's going to be six years of over a hundred million, and then just the waterfall of people coming out and having more and more and more and more information. But I think the first guy who had any of that news, at least out there in the Twitter sphere, was Steve. And so, you know, this Steve is a guy who I've been reading for several years, and I even had him on. I did a podcast out at one point to share with uh, the Giants baseball page that I run on Facebook. And this was like like two or three years ago. I remember we were talking about you know Lincecum signing an extension after <laughs> after his, uh, his you know after he was done with with all with with his first contract, and um, and so that's how far far uh, long ago it was. And so since then, you know, he's really become uh, a, a big fixture in the Bay Area sports media. So there's even that avenue, which is build your own website and find an audience and do that kind of thing. So there's, yeah, you know, there are opportunities out there. And again, you know, props on, on, on sticking with it. So, you know, let's talk about the Kaepernick thing. So by the time people probably listen to this, it'll be, it'll be Thursday, but on Wednesday, midday, the news broke that Colin Kaepernick has signed an extension with the 49ers, which will pay him, you know, at least $61 million guaranteed and a bunch of clauses and bonuses which could take the contract to over $100 million. Uh, you have, uh, you have your, your finger on the pulse of you know, what people feel about this just by uh, being in, in the field that you are. Uh, how did, how, what did you think when you first heard about the contract? Well, first, you know, i got to give it up to the Bay Area sports guy. It was, it was interesting. I was you know, on Twitter – I get ready for my show, and my friends over at Warriors World, who have been real good to me and come on the show all the time, uh, they retweeted Barrier Sports Guy, and I saw it right away. So it was before it was on ESPN.com, before anything else. So big ups to him. He, you know, he was the first that I saw break it as well. So we're on the same boat with that. Um, first, I'll start with with what I'm seeing from other people, and generally it is that Colin Kaepernick is getting paid a lot of money, which is you know absolutely the truth. But a lot of people are saying, well, what has he done? You know, he hasn't won a Super Bowl. The 49ers were 31st in passing last year. We haven't seen the array of throws that great quarterbacks make. I think by that they generally mean those touch passes, you know, great accuracy on the deep ball. Some of those things we haven't seen, and all those are valid points. But the reality is, in the NFL today, if you have a quarterback, a decent one, you know, above average, you have a chance to compete. If you don't have a quarterback, which we've seen this with the 49ers before, before Alex Smith was, you know, uh, remade by Jim Harbaugh, we saw what bad quarterback play could do. I mean, it was 10 years between playoff appearances for the 49ers. So that's the cost of doing business. An above-average quarterback is in the command $16 million plus. I would say Colin Kaepernick is more than above average. Is he in that top five yet? Not a chance. There's the, the old guard is still hanging on. The Brady, Breeze, Rogers, Manning, and then add whoever fifth guy you want is kind of hanging on. But Colin Kaepernick's right underneath that. Um, if you don't re-sign him to that, you run two risks. One, he leaves after next year, and you're stuck searching for a quarterback. Or I guess you start playing Gafford. Um, <laughs> the second one is, <laughs> say the Niners win the Super Bowl this year. That I, this contract's going to average out twenty one million. If he hits every incentive, if he misses a few incentives, you're talking about 19 million a year. If he wins the Super Bowl next year, he's going for that Flacco money, which is 22 million a year. So if you believe in him and you think he can be your quarterback for the future, you got to roll with him. You got to go. With, you got to pay. Romo's making 18 million a year. He's 34 years old and hasn't won in the playoffs. Um, Jay Cutler hasn't won much in the playoffs. He's in his 30s. He's making 18 million a year. Colin Kaepernick's in his mid 20s. His best football is coming up ahead of him, and he's making what above-average quarterbacks in the NFL make. I don't think the deal in any way is a bad deal for the 49ers. And I'm going to tie a bunch of sports into one here. There was another interesting article that came out today. Jurgen Klinsmann, head coach, USA Soccer, says, why do teams pay for past performance like the Kobe Bryant deal? Right. Kobe got $48.5 million for two years. Kobe's not a max player anymore. He's a great player, a Hall of Famer, one of the best of all time. He's no longer a big-time player. You don't pay for past performance. You pay for what you think you're going to get. And the 49ers truly believe, I just pulled a Jaworski there, 
<laughs> they, you know, they believe that he's the quarterback for the future. So paying him that money, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, to be honest. So look, I, uh, I'm using overthecap.com, and they have the breakdown of uh, NFL quarterbacks. The interesting thing about the quarterback salaries is – the guaranteed money versus the total value, like you said, with you know hitting these bonuses, uh-huh. and uh, you mentioned Joe Flacco because he signed a hundred and twenty million dollar contract, but he own and I'm saying only based on comparison because <laughs> twenty nine million dollar guarantee, I'm in, but at, you know he's only his the percent of his contract guaranteed is only twenty four percent, so he's guaranteed. Uh, to make twenty nine million, and obviously will make more based on h- hitting his bonuses. But his guarantee per year is only five million dollars. So you go uh-huh. to you go to uh, someone like uh, uh, Matt Stafford. Now Stafford's uh, contract is going to be up in two thousand and eighteen. Um, so the the length of it wasn't uh, wasn't the same, but. His guarantee per year is thirteen point eight million dollars, so seventy eight point three percent of his contract is in guaranteed money. Now Kaep- uh-huh. Kaepernick got the highest guarantee ever for the total yep. length of the contract in sixty one million. The second highest guarantee uh, is now uh, Aaron Rodgers, who is, who's guaranteed fifty four million when he signed his contract. But right underneath that, and my my buddy Brad Evans is going to be very sad. Well, he probably already knows this, but Sam Bradford, <laughs> right underneath Aaron Rodgers when it comes to overall guaranteed money. Um, but you know, it's th- these numbers are amazing, and and you know the way that these contracts are done. You know, it is really sort of like wizardry when it comes to the salary cap, and the 49ers are are lucky to have the guys that they have doing that stuff. Um, but you know, even Peyton Manning, like ninety six million dollar contract, but only eighteen million of that is guaranteed. Uh, and I, I'm sure a lot of that bonus stuff is probably pretty easy to get. But the, just the way these teams do these contracts is super interesting. Uh, uh, let's see, there is where is uh, Tom Brady? Like Tom Brady. He for 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 a, an average per year salary, he's only at eleven million dollars right now. Uh, but you know, almost sixty percent of that is guaranteed. So it's kind of kind of interesting. Like the teams do these deals differently. I'm sure based on the cap. And you know, if I was a little bit smarter and if I did better in math, I'd probably understand this even more. But uh, the, the way that the Niners do this, it looks like you know from the from the guarantee uh, money there. You know, his cap is uh, Kaepernick is going to average probably about. What does it come out to? About ten million uh, a year guaranteed. So, the, uh, the the way that the way that he you know he said early on you know I'm going to do this contract, but I do want to do it in a way that frees up money for other guys like Crabtree, Ayupati, you know who the Niners will need to to resign as well. And according to uh, Adam Schefter, he said that the way that they did the deal would allow them some freedom. I think Kaepernick's. Uh, average this year is really low in comparison to how it it will go up so they'll have some wiggle room this year uh and and then you know we'll see what happens but you know this this nfl contract business is 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 quite crazy and i don't completely understand it and i'm just going to rely on the guys who do understand it who report this stuff yeah you know it, it, a lot of it you know depends on where they load these bonuses to be paid out um, I know last year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Drew Brees in his new deal made over $40 million last year alone. A lot of that was a bonus that was front-loaded into the contract. So these guys that are way smarter than you and I, no offense, Gigi, um, <laughs> you know, they, they figure all this stuff out. And those years where their salary is going to be less, they pay the quarterback more. And those years where the quarterback's going to be paid less, they go out and spend on other parts of the roster. When you look at I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but I know that, you know, Kaepernick obviously is going to take up a big portion of the cap going forward, but the cap is supposed to rise significantly by $30 million in the next four years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, it's just a, a significant amount. You add on top of that, you know, Justin Smith, as great as he is, probably his last year as a 49er, that money is going to come off the books. The questions on Alden Smith, that money eventually comes off the books. Um, and they're, you know, Anquan Bolden, love him to death, great um, in his one year as a Niner, and hopefully great as his next year as a 49er. But that money won't stay around for too long either. When you 
when you when you sign a quarterback to a big deal like this, you have to be sure of two things: one, that he can lead you to victory, and two, that you're solid enough in the front office to make sure that you make the right moves that follow that. If you look at the New York Giants, they didn't shore up other areas of the field. They let their linebacking core grow. They let their offensive line go. And now all of a sudden you have this, you know, a good quarterback in Eli Manning who has no team around him. And he's not quite the quarterback to carry a bad team to the playoffs. Is he very good? Can he take a good team over the top? Yes. But he can't carry an, an average team or below average team to the promised land. Same thing to me with Joe Flacco. I think the 49ers have enough stockpiled in the middle of, of both the offense and the defense, from the line on both sides to the linebacking core, and then you add in a safety like Eric Reed. You add in a, an, um, on uh, the guy they drafted this year. I'm losing his name. Uh, the other guy who's going to play nickel and then eventually move into safety. Um, you know, they have enough of a spine, and they're strong enough for the other areas that they can let certain guys walk. They've done enough building depth. You have to have a plan when you give a quarterback this much money. And I think the 49ers have it. But if you don't give a quarterback this much money, then where are you going to go? Who are you going to start? Are you going to go draft another guy and start all over again? So I totally understand where they're coming from. And I think they're actually set up to have success, although Kaepernick will take up a huge portion of their salary cap. Right. You're thinking of Jimmy Ward, the guy that they just Jimmy Ward, yes. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree with you, and uh, it, it's it's much like the flip. What's the flip side? The flip side is you know the years from uh, 2003 through 2010. Like that, that's the flip side. Like you want to go back to that, fine, but I don't. So I'll, I'll trust. I'll trust these guys to to continue building this team. Now let's 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 switch gears to the San Francisco Giants. Uh, as we are recording this, they are playing the Reds in the second game of three game set. Uh, they were uh, they played terribly yesterday, just awful. But uh, today they are they are winning in the eighth inning, three to two. Um, but you know that that's the that the, the fact that they're winning today is not not the story. The story is the fact that they're playing so well. They are mm-hmm. uh, as of this recording, thirty seven and twenty one. Best record in baseball, and I have to say that I am a little surprised at at the record. I, I thought that they would be a good team, but maybe not this good early on. Um, and while uh, while they are miles ahead of uh, of the Dodgers and the Rockies right now, you know the baseball season isn't even halfway done, so there's a lot of time. But are you as surprised as I am at the start? And did you expect them to come out so strong in this, you know, first uh, third of the season? I'm completely surprised at how good they've been. And there's a couple of reasons. First, when I looked at this roster, it's the same one that's been up and down. Um, you know, I don't, I, from last year's team that really struggled, I believe, you know, went uh, 76 and 86 last year, they really struggled. And I didn't feel like they made enough additions to the team to really put them over any sort of hump. Additionally, I looked at the Dodgers roster and I said, man, that's going to be tough to overcome. I mean, you're more or less looking at an all-star team rolling out every single night. What's made it even more surprising to me, Garrett, is that when you look up and down the lineup and you look through the pitching staff, let's start with the starting rotation. Madison Bumgarner really turned it around last month. He's having a good year. Tim Hudson, the best signing of anybody in the offseason. If you can pay a guy who's having Cy Young numbers about $10 million a year, that's called winning. So they've got him going. Vogelsong's really turned it around. But Matt Cain's been in and out of the rotation. He's been up and down when he's pitched. Tim Lincecum, you and I both, I think, have an affinity for him. <laughs> I was really hoping his, his, his production would be you know, much better, and he's sitting with a 5.01 ERA at the moment. You look at the, the lineup offensively, on help with Gaunt's having a career year. But after that, tell me who on this team is exceeding expectations, maybe the exception of Michael Morse. Everybody else on this team is struggling in comparison to what we expect from them. But suppose he's batting, I, just, I think he's got his average of 270 right now. Um, when you look at Pablo Sandoval, he's been hot lately. But for the year, he's around 250. Um, you know, and, and Hunter Pence has come back around, but he's still below his career averages. So if you're going to tell me 
that some of the most important guys in the lineup and two-fifths of the rotation weren't going to be having good years and the Giants were going to have the best record in baseball, I'd have told you you're crazy. I'd have been ecstatic, but I would have told you you're crazy. The one thing the Giants have been able to rely upon all year is a very stout bullpen. That's been the only thing that's really given them a, a, a level of consistency at a, at a high level throughout this season. Everything else has been so up and down, and somehow they're still 37-21. and 21. It really blows me away. And how's this for a little bit of, uh, of Giants trivia today? Buster Posey's slugging percentage, 401. Brandon Crawford, the number eight hitter, slugging percentage, 422. That's crazy. And, and, and you know, you, Pablo, you know, see, he's always going to get as much flack as anybody on this team because of his sort of happy-go-lucky, you know, maybe he's a little uncaring for the hardcore fan. Uh, he's off injured. He, he's got a weight problem. He can't wait to eat. Um, you know, the, the, but to, like... I get that, and I understand that, and and hey, you know, you want to make fun of Pablo, you know, I'm sure I've done it before, uh, but let, let you know, the guy who is supposed to, you know, who who's the who, who is the highest salaried, you know, regular everyday player, and who's you know in that three hole, and who's kind of the future in the franchise. I mean, he's hitting two sixty four you know, with a four hundred one slugging percentage, uh, and you know, you kind of have to – you have to put him at first every once in a while so he doesn't get dinged up. He doesn't want to catch Timmy or maybe Timmy doesn't want to throw to him. You know, he, he doesn't want to get beat up back there so poor Hector gets beat up. And so that – you know, your your franchise guy is not even having a halfway decent season. And like you said, yet they're still able to win ball games. And I think you're right on the money with the bullpen. Last year – when when the trade deadline hit, you know, I, I had been sending out some tweets saying, you know, the thing that they could do that it won't even cost them a lot is to just build up that bullpen because the bullpen, you know, they, they were having, you know, issues with it. And, you know, you got emotional Romo uh, not wanting to talk to beat writers when he doesn't do well. And, and, and so, you know, there there's lots of there were there were there were issues last year. And I thought, you know, let's you know, we, we should we should try to add to this bullpen and you know I, I don't you know they they relied on you know guys like machi and uh the who's the guy that uh um they they let uh they let one of those guys go i can't remember his name but this year you know the bullpen has been lights out i mean you even have someone like you know Gutierrez who uh is probably the worst arm in, in the bullpen and and not, i don't i don't mean by how hard he throws i just mean by stuff wise and he's still you know a reliable guy with a with a 3 you know 3 ERA so great stuff there um you got to expect uh, the pitching to catch up, the starting pitching catch up with them just a little bit because of how up and down they are, you know, it, with mm-hmm. the one exception of Madison Bumgarner. But uh, hopefully the bats will 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 come around. I can't I can't imagine that Buster and Pablo hit you know two sixty and two forty for the rest of the year. Uh, and you know they're getting it done too with their starting second baseman hitting one seventy nine. Like it's kind of nuts. Uh, yeah, and then the reality is you know. Scudero's not coming back or not for any significant role. So I think the biggest thing for the Giants going forward, it's great that you bring up second base. They have to find a solution there because I don't know if it's sustainable to have a guy like Brandon Hicks who hit the home run every once in a while. But really, you know, is, is not a viable option at second base. No offense to him. That's going to be the big hole I think they have to fill up. Um, you know, it's interesting something that you brought up is, is, you know, Buster's batting 264, like you said, and he gets kind of a free pass. And every time Pablo makes a mistake, it's the end of the world. It's funny in, in the media and with fans, there are certain people that we pick out or that we make a point to, you know, scrutinize very heavily. And other guys get a very free pass. And, you know, uh, when we start talking about the NBA Finals, it's very applicable to some, some of the guys in that situation as well. But I, I, I'm, always, I'm always fascinated as to why we choose certain players that get the passes and certain players that get the brunt of the of the anger. It's, it's funny how that works out. It is funny, and I think some people are just really easy targets, and other people are uh, are not. Um, when you have the pedigree that Buster Posey did coming out of high school and college, 
being a, a top pick, you know, he probably would have been the first or second pick in the draft if teams weren't afraid of, of him holding out for top dollar. And the Giants, you know, had the benefit of, of not really worrying about that and drafting him. But he kind of came into the league as, as such a highly touted prospect, whereas, you know, I, I, I remember watching Pablo Sandoval at San Jose playing catcher, you know, and, <laughs> and, and not not very highly touted prospect. And it, uh, there was a big d- – d- do you remember the story that Andrew Baggerly wrote where he he said that there there may be a racial element to to a lot of the the flack that some of the Latin ball players get, and I didn't completely agree with him, but I would say that I agreed with him a little bit more than 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 not. And man, people absolutely hated Baggerly, and this is probably the most popular beat writer that the Giants have, and they mm-hmm. just they they just disliked that article a ton. And and while you know, I, I thought it was very smartly written. I thought it was pretty ballsy to write, um, and and I did agree with some points. I think that is a, a small piece of uh, of the reason that Pablo gets a lot of flack is, you know, that there there is you know, and th- and this has been sort of, um, even back to when you know Latin ball players were coming into the league. I think a lot of Latin ball players had to escape the stereotype that they weren't smart. And that they mm-hmm. weren't well managed, and that they were, you know, they they were a little sort of play the way that they want to play with flair, or whatever. You know, you see Puig with the bat flip, and I think, you know, he has somehow, with the exception of Giants fans, <laughs> has turned this this sort of flashiness into into a good gig where you know every media network sort of follows whatever he does, and more power to him. Um, but there, there has been an element historically of ballplayers who can't speak English and who come from poor backgrounds, and it's almost like there's a little bit more of a free pass to, to, for fans to be harder on those guys. Think about this. Pablo Sandoval is, is, is as talented as a hitter as anybody you'll ever see. Now, he does chase a lot of bad pitches, and he swings at everything. Same could be said for Vladimir Guerrero. And they were always questioned about their pitch selection. They are always questioned about their baseball acumen, right? That's true. All that's documented. You can find stories for years on both of them. Conversely, let's look at a guy like Adam Dunn. Adam Dunn swings at everything as well. Adam Dunn is all or nothing, much similar to Vladimir Guerrero at times and Pablo Sandoval at times. Has anybody once ever written anything about Adam Dunn being an unintelligent baseball player? Probably not. Not once. I've never, I've never seen anything. It's an interesting dynamic. I, I'm not going to say that it's, you know, a racial assault or anything like that. But the reality is, you're perceived differently depending on your background and your backstory. Much like you said, Buster Posey has the pedigree. Everybody always assumes they'll get out of it. Conversely, every time Pablo Sandoval makes a mistake, everybody goes, "He doesn't know any better." It's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, and you know, uh, we could probably talk for you know an hour about that uh, on, on its own. But you know, let, let's quickly. Uh, you, you brought up the NBA ever so slightly, uh, and, and I want to move in that direction. Before we get to the finals, uh, I want to talk about Mark Jackson, and I wrote about this uh, on my website. Um, I had a conversation with Jim Barnett, the Warriors color guy. This would this would have been several months ago. Uh, a buddy invited me to to this uh, to this um, this dinner where Jim was speaking, and it was to hit my buddy's clients. And I was not part of the clientele, but he knows how much I'm into basketball, and you know he let me know that Jim was going to be there. And you know my dad followed the Warriors, you know back when Jim was playing, so he was excited. I was like, yeah, you know, definitely go. And I withheld talking about this this meeting with Jim, or you know, it wasn't even a meeting. It was a, it was just sort of like open conversation. Um, but you know, I would say I probably asked about eighty five percent of the questions <laughs> amongst the uh, you know fifteen people or whatever. Um, I, and I mentioned, I told him, I said, you know, I, I won't say any of this stuff because I think his fear when I told him what my background was at KMBR, his fear was that I was going to 
write about or talk about or tell somebody some of the things that he was saying. And he has since gone on record with a lot of mm-hmm. this stuff. So I felt I felt like I could actually talk about it. And I wrote so I wrote up something about it. But the whole Mark Jackson thing, when I was talking to Jim about the Mark Jackson thing, the the rumors were already there that Mark was going to have to take this team, you know, to the second round or maybe even further or else he was going to get fired. And so there was that in the air, but we didn't necessarily talk about that as much as we did talk about um rumors of of Jackson not allowing Jerry West into practice. I think Barnett has stated now that he wasn't allowed into practice. Uh, Mark had the opportunity to, you know, whenever he saw Jim to, you know, say hi and use Jim's name and just wouldn't do it for whatever reason. And so there was some stuff there that are kind of like communication and relationship issues that Jackson may have had. Um but, you know, there were other things that, that Jim talked about that I found so alarming just because this is a professional basketball team and a very good one. And Jim, you know, was dissatisfied. And a- actually, I won't say he was dissatisfied. I think he was underwhelmed by the coaching staff because I had asked him about, you know, just guys getting better fundamentally. And he wasn't so sure that the current coaching staff could help them improve and I was like alarmed. I'm like, wait, some of these guys are ex-ball players. Are you saying you know they don't know how to coach or whatever? And he he didn't say that, but he did leave it as you know the I, I don't think these will be the guys to 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 help you know the younger players. And so just that conversation that I had with Jim, I was like, okay, I can, I think I have an idea of what's going to happen here with Jackson. And I'm not saying he told me anything about what was going to happen, but just the things that we were talking about, he I, I could tell that. You know, just the inner workings of what was going on with the Warriors was probably not as solid as uh, fans would have liked it to be. And then we saw what happened with, you know, Jackson gets let go. And then there's stories coming out about, you know, how uh, just the way that he dealt with certain people in the organization. And, you know, maybe there was issues with, you know, that, that were related to his faith. And there's a lot of stuff that has come out since then. But from your point of view, being a Bay Area sports fan, you're not necessarily a diehard Warriors fan as as much as as I am. But you know the you know the scene just as well as anybody. Just thoughts on a lot of the drama that came out of that Mark Jackson situation, and uh, you know, do do you think? I, I mean, it's not really. I guess it's kind of old news now to say was it smart or not. But you know, then the hiring of, of Steve Kerr. Well, I think the interesting thing is, is that, you know, Mark Jackson made it very clear. I always found this interesting through the second half of last season. Mark Jackson, I could, you know, you get a sense he was very insecure because he made it a point to let everybody know everything that he had ever done with his team. And most coaches that are secure, or most coaches that feel like they've, or most people, I'm going to get my minor in psychology here on you. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I don't have to tell everybody everything I do well. They see it on their own. Right. Um, And when I don't do things well, I also, you know, I just let it be. I let people see me from the outside and determine my level of success or not, whether that's my radio show, my, you know, being a man, my marriage, my whatever it happens to be. I let other people can make their determination as long as I feel like I'm doing things right. If I have to go out of my way to tell you, everything that I've done and everything I'm good at, that's generally the sign of someone who's insecure. Right. And if you look through, throughout the second part of the season, Mark Jackson was constantly talking about how first time, first Warriors coach to make the playoffs, first Warriors coach 50 wins, and, and, and a myriad of other things that he would bring up. And to me that said that he knew that he wasn't doing something right, whether he wanted to admit it or not. And all the stories that have come out since – lead me to believe that, you know, he alienated, and I'm not there, but people that are, are very, you know, knowledgeable and trustworthy sources, he went out of his way to make it, you know, a lot of coaches say us against the world, but they don't, they don't mean like the 20 people in the locker room. They mean the franchise against the world. Mark Jackson literally meant the 20 people in the locker room against the world. And for a coach to have the level of success that Mark Jackson had in his two years, 
And to get fired tells me that he's extremely difficult to work with and that he's not receptive to receptive to um, constructive criticism or, or suggestions. Because if a coach does what he did, under 99% of circumstances, there's going to be an amicable relationship between him and his bosses. And conversely, he had a terrible relationship with his bosses. Um, you know, for me, I, you can tell the, co- the players loved Mark Jackson, but the fact that there was two issues within his coaching staff and that he never got a vote of confidence from management, it makes me wonder, you know, what was really going on behind the scenes. And everything that you've seen reported since would say that it, it was really ugly. Um, Moving on to the Steve Kerr portion of it, I wonder how it sells in the locker room when they get rid of a, a coach that all the players love for another coach with no experience. That's going to be the interesting dynamic through next season. Um, if Steve Kerr can coach and he proves it to the players right away, I don't think there's any issue. But if 10 games in, the Warriors are 3-7, and 4-6 and six <laughs> even, and the, the players are like, what the hell is he talking about? Then we could have an issue on our hands. This team is too talented to not make the playoffs. With the proper coaching, this is a top-four team in the West. I I do believe that. Um, But without proper coaching, they end up in a tough series like they were, no home court advantage against the Clippers, and then they end up having a difficult time getting out of the first round. Um, Mark Jackson is is a great guy, and uh, by the accounts of his players, and they seem to love him. I mean, I don't know personally. I'm on the inside. But he kind of reminds me of Scott Brooks. The Thunder players like Scott Brooks as well. But the X's and O's aren't there. And they win because they have talent. That was the same thing that happened with Mark Jackson. If Steve Kerr's a good coach, he could take the Warriors to another level. If he's not a good coach, they'll end up in the same spot that they were with Mark Jackson. Because they have enough talent just to be good on that. that that's just how I look at that team. Now, quick, quick thought on... Kevin Love, would, would you trade Clay and whoever else it takes to to get Kevin Love? I, I find that Love thing interesting, and it's tough because the West is so good right now. And and I wonder if if the Timberwolves just missed on all these number one picks that they they never got it right. But also, when I look at big time superstars in the NBA, they all make the playoffs at least on a somewhat regular basis. Um, do, do you want Kevin Love? Is he an upgrade over David Lee? Yes. 100% no doubt about that. Um, where is your team if you give up Lee, Barnes, and, and Clay to get Kevin Love? And you're going to be over the cap. Where are you going to fill out your depth? Here's, here becomes the question. Teams with a quote unquote big three or a group of players that, that is superior, you know, superiorly talented, they have to be so good that, that depth isn't the biggest issue. When you look at a team like Miami, they have Bosch, LeBron, Wade. Now they've been able to fill out some depth, but that team would have been in contention even without a whole lot of depth just because those three guys are so good. Do you believe that a quote unquote big three of Steph, Kevin Love and Andre Iguodala, can that win you the West without a lot of depth because their cap situation wouldn't, you know, and you throw in that to Andrew Bogut there, he's a great player, but he's not one of those big three. Is that core good enough to get you to a championship? I don't know if you're any further than having, you know, Lee, Clay, and Barnes, but I don't know if you're any closer. So sometimes I kind of feel like it might be a lateral move. Um, I think Kevin Love, would benefit greatly from a guy who could protect the rim like an Andrew Bogut because what he's playing with in, in Minnesota right now, Pekovic is a great scorer, but there's no rim protection on that team. They can't keep teams out of the paint. He wouldn't have to deal with those last-second shots. That's a step thing. So I really think he could flourish, but I wonder how weak they are after their top four if they trade away everybody. But I think the general rule of thumb, if you can get an all-star, a guy who's a perennial all-star, for guys who are really good players, you go with the all-star and figure it out from there. But I'm not 100% sold in that. I think you make the deal for the Warriors if you could, but I don't think it's a sure thing that that puts you in that upper echelon of teams. Yeah, I think you make the deal. I think 
you have it if you bring the same team back and the only thing you do is change the coach, I think any sort of success that is more than what you had the previous year is minimal. Um, and, and it's sort of like a, uh, a bit of a, a growing thing where, you know, maybe min- minimally you can, you can, uh, you, you can get better. But I think the one big splash that will excite the fan base and that will, uh, really, you know, rejigger the team is when you can bring in an all-star and one thing that you know can't forget that more than likely when when you have to re-up clay he's going to be making more money than steph just based on his position and yeah. and how you know where steph was in his contract agreement so if you re-sign clay to 12 or 13 million you probably got to go back to steph and redo that contract uh, a little bit, so you know, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things involved, but I think uh, you know because of the fact, like like you just said, you know, when when you have a chance to to sign an all star, and, and and in 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 that case, I think David Lee is is sort of addition by subtraction. I, I know there are some big D Lee fans out there, but I thought I thought he was vi- I thought he was less than good the second half of the season and in the playoffs when we needed him most they seemed to play better when he was on the bench even though they had to go small with Draymond but that team seemed to play more inspired when Lee was out than when he was in and I think that says something to you know when when your crunch team when your crunch minutes and, and the guys who you trust to get you back in games or to keep you in games is without your highest paid player so I think that's an easy got to go but otherwise yeah I, you know I, I would do it I, I can see why people wouldn't do it uh, the, I, I don't like Kevin Love's game 100% either I, I actually like Blake Griffin's game a lot more than Kevin Kevin Love's game mm-hmm. but uh, you know they're you know that's who he's often compared to so um, but yeah I think it's uh, I think I think it'll be very a very f- uh, a very fun off season just listening to you know all the hullabaloo about Kevin Love and you know, here, here's a, here's a couple couple quick points. Uh, when you listen to Steve Kerr talk in his press conference, he's looking for a stretch four type player within his system. He wants a guy more like Kevin Love, a guy who can step out to the three point line, not just David Lee, who saw it from 19. So I think if the Warriors were, if they did have the opportunity to make that move, I think they would. Um, I don't think they would actually. I don't even think they would hesitate. I, you and I can hesitate because we're sitting here thinking about it. But I think the Warriors would be pretty committed. Um, Secondly, the interesting thing, this is what I always, everybody always bags on Blake Griffin. <laughs> I mean, I know he's a flopper, and I know that there's some other, you know, off the court and all that stuff. But he's talking about a guy who goes for 20 and 10 and can score in the paint, you know, with the best of them. He can learn how to, throughout the history of the league, guys can learn to shoot jumpers. His jumper's gotten significantly better. And eventually, maybe one day he could get out to the three point line. I, I mean, that I don't know. But Kevin Love can't score the way that Blake Griffin does. Blake Griffin can learn to shoot. I would take Blake Griffin every, every day over Kevin Love. And, and Kevin Love's a good player, but I would take Blake Griffin every day over him. All right, so quick quick NBA Finals uh, preview here. Uh, you are a big LeBron James fan. Did, did that? Did that? Uh, did that happen? Like right when he came into the league? Like is that when you became a, a big LeBron fan, or has that grown over the over the years? Um, you know, honestly, I remember I was a freshman playing for Young Randall uh, over at Del Mar High School, <laughs> and LeBron James was a senior in high school, and he was this big hype. I still have the uh, Sports Illustrated cover from when he was at St. Vincent, St. Mary. I still have it in the closet. Um, and I was just like, you know, with all the hype going on around him, I was like, this is going to be my generation's, and I hate to comparison, but at the time I'm thinking, this is going to be my generation's Michael Jordan to the next greatest player of all time, and that's who we were going to grow up with, everybody that was around my age. And so I remember getting home early um, to watch his his debut against the Sacramento Kings, and I remember the first time I ever bought League Pass was to watch LeBron James in Cleveland, his third year in the league, I believe, I started getting League Pass, and uh, it was just, you know, it was kind of I wanted to have, before he was as good as he is now, I mean, I always wanted to have my generation's greatest player, and I wanted to watch him and appreciate him. And luckily, I feel like he hasn't disappointed us. He's been um, as good as advertised, maybe even better. And, um, you know, he's one of the all-time greats. But I've honestly liked him since the 2002-2003 school year when I was at Del Mar as a freshman. 
the this finals is a rematch of last year's finals, obviously, that San Diego had in their hands until the big shot by Ray Allen and then Miami going out and winning game seven. Um were you were you looking forward to seeing a rematch, or did you want to see Oklahoma City come out just to you know get a different matchup, even though they were the matchup the year before? Uh, what what were your thoughts on who uh, would give? I guess who would create the better the better finals matchup for Miami? I think without question, San Antonio is a better finals matchup. Um, Oklahoma City is supremely talented. But the reality is Miami knows how to beat them. I think that Miami was looking at that series. Um, you know, when, when, when San Antonio went up 2-0, I think everybody was gearing up for, for San Antonio-Miami. All of a sudden, Oklahoma City comes roaring back. And, you know, I, they, they would never say this to you, but I guarantee you everybody on Miami was looking at Chops going, we're going to get a 3 if Oklahoma City gets to the finals. As, as talented as they are, Eric Spolster would have – a significant advantage over Scott Brooks. Kevin Durant, second best player in the league, but he'd be matched up directly with the best player in the league, so they lose that advantage. Russell Westbrook, at this point in his career, a little bit better than Dwayne Wade, but the advantage is enough to make up some of the other areas. Miami beats Oklahoma City in five games, in my opinion, and I don't think it's really that hard, to be completely honest with you. Um, San Antonio, to me, I said this at the beginning of the year, I said this at the middle of the year. And I said this when uh, Miami was finishing the season 11-14. and 14. I said, San Antonio is the only team that can beat Miami. They're the only team that's talented enough, disciplined enough, and understands the game well enough to beat Miami. So, for me, San Antonio was the only matchup for them in the whole league, West or East Conference, that was going to give Miami a run. And I'm glad that we're going to get this matchup again. So, most people are looking at this series and saying San Antonio a little bit better and Miami slightly worse. And when you look at it that way, you know, it could be just as even as, as, uh, as it ever could be in this matchup. What are your thoughts when people say that? And do you think, or do you believe that? Do you think Miami is actually a little bit worse off than they were last year? So I think that San Antonio has upgraded in certain areas. I think that um, Gary Neal leaving and replacing him with Patty Mills. Patty Mills is a little bit more athletic, a better defender. He can shoot just as well, if not better, than Gary Neal. And Gary Neal played a huge role in the finals last year. I also believe that um, you know Tim Duncan has had another great year, Tony Parker another great year, Kawhi Leonard has improved. So I, I, I agree with the sentiment that San Antonio has gotten a little bit better. I don't disagree with that whatsoever. Miami, you might say on the whole, in terms of overall talent, has dipped a little bit. And I don't think that that would be inaccurate. But the biggest thing for Miami right now, and the reason that I think they feel better, is that going into the finals last year, Dwayne Wade was in a funk. I mean, his knee was bad. He was hobbling all over the court. He couldn't do much. This year, he's played back-to-back really strong series against Brooklyn and Indiana. And if you're Miami, you have to have full confidence that he can be a number two on a championship team. So while the overall level of talent may have dipped a little bit, I feel like Dwayne Wade's increase in play and increase in health is worth more than that overall dip in, in talent. I think, yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it, most definitely. Um who do you who do you look at as the X factor in this series? Who who's the guy that if if he can do what's expected of him and maybe a little bit more, he could change the outcome of this series? Because I'm thinking I'm thinking of Tony Parker on San Antonio last year. He was able to uh, he I mean he was he was a thorn in Miami's side, getting to the rim, shooting runners, getting floaters. And uh, this year he comes into the playoffs a little dinged up. He's got the hamstring problem. And I feel if he plays the the way that he can play, he's going to be the biggest X factor of the series. Now, you know, Miami Miami traps a lot, uh, but San Antonio passes so well. I, I, feel like, I feel like they'll get some good matchups with Parker able to get to the rim. And it's not like, you know, outside of the Birdman, uh, Miami doesn't really have a rim protector on their own. 
who do you think is the guy who could be the X factor uh, of for this whole series? I'm, I'm going to give you two, and I'm going to give you one on each side. The first off is with San Antonio. Um, when you look at last year's series, a lot of people thought that Manu Ginobili was, was you know, uh, done after this series. He only averaged 11 and a half points, which is, you know, below his standards. But I think more importantly, as a secondary ball handler in their offense, his turnover rate was t- over 23%. He played about as bad of a series as you'll see somebody who's a key contributor to a team. I don't anticipate him playing as bad this year. He put together a, an okay series, again, an up-and-down series against Oklahoma City. But if you watch some closeout game six, he was phenomenal. He was outside of Tim Duncan. He was the second-best player on that team with Tony Parker in the locker room. So I anticipate him having a big impact on this series. If he plays at a high level, Miami's in trouble. The second X factor in the series on the Miami side is not one player. It's a multitude of players. LeBron's going to get his. We all know that. I feel pretty confident in Dwayne Wade getting his. And Chris Bosch will always give you something. Um, It might not be that 18 points and 10 rebounds, but he's going to contribute on the defensive end. He'll knock down some open jump shots. So I believe those three are all going to be there. The key is what they get out of a fourth guy. And that fourth guy can rotate. We saw it last year in the finals. Some games it was Ray Allen. Some games it was Mike Miller. Some games it was Shane Betty, but they have to have a fourth guy who's hitting some shots and making an impact on the game. If they can get a fourth guy, they're going to be really, really tough to beat. If they can get a fourth guy, and it doesn't have to be the same guy every game, but if one of those guys can have a big night, so you really only, if you really think about it, if Shane Betty has one huge game, uh, Rashard Lewis has one huge game, Ray Allen has one huge game, and maybe Mario Chalmers has another huge game, or the Birdman, they're going to be in good position, but somebody else in the supporting cast for Miami is going to have to step up. So really the battle is, to me, as crazy as it sounds, the battle is who plays better, Miami's fourth guy or Manu Ginobili, and that kind of is the answer to who wins the series for me. I think it's that tight. The Spurs are not the type of team that uh, that does a lot of talking. They let their coach kind of take the headlines there with the way that he answers questions from the media. Um, but after after they uh, they put away Oklahoma City, um, David Aldridge was uh, talking to Tim Duncan, and Tim Duncan said, "We have four more games to win. We'll do it this time." And that is about as much of a guarantee as you yeah. can get from someone who you know is is does, doesn't really talk all that much. So it, it kind of shocked a lot of people. Uh, Tim Tim usually lets his uh, talking on the or, or lets his playing on the court do the talking, and LeBron kind of took uh, took note of that, and I think he said something to the effect of, "Yeah, I can sort of sense that that they don't like us that much by based on Timmy's comments," and he's also since come out and said that, you know, he's a little bothered that people think that last year's title win uh, is is was lucky and, and wasn't earned. I found the you know the, the chatter a little interesting, uh, but do you think that uh, do you think that the way that these guys are thinking that it, it, it does is it going to change anything about this series? Is Tim now that he's made this proclamation and, and his teammates kind of have to stand up with him? I mean, do, they seem to be a professional enough team to where that doesn't matter, or but but still you know you still have to back up that claim, and then in the bronze side it's like. Yeah, I could see where that could be a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. And is that what he's using it for? Like, what do you think about both of those guys uh, speaking out? Well, I think with Duncan, we'll start off there. I think that for him, it's it's it's, it's along the lines of okay, we had Game Six in the bag and we we didn't close it out. We choked it away. Um, you know, Miami made some big plays down the stretch, but San Antonio had a lot of opportunities to put that game away. So for him, this series is about redemption, and he goes into it. He's worked all year. And I add on top of that, that he missed a bunny over Shane Battier that could have tied Game 7. And instead, LeBron went down, hit a jumper. They were up four with under 40 seconds to go. So Tim Duncan spent the last, let's say, 11 months, almost 12 months now, thinking about what he could have done more. So now he's in the moment. He's just amped up. To me, that's all the comment was. Um, when LeBron says that the Spurs don't like them, I don't think it's anything personal, but on a 
basketball standpoint, how could you like the person that <laughs> ripped your heart out and took <laughs> away from you the one thing that you wanted? All you want to do is Tim Duncan is get another championship. And you were right there and somebody took it away from you. Garrett, if you came in and took my job at the radio station, I love you, man, but I would probably be a little upset with you, too. You know what I mean? There's no way around that. It's impossible to, to avoid that. So, of course, they don't like them, but I don't think it's anything on a personal level. I think it's more of a, you know, when you're the guy at the top, nobody wants, nobody likes you. Everybody wants to take what you have. Um, from the LeBron thing, I think it's very interesting that people call it luck. And I only say that because luck is hitting a shot from half court off the window. Luck is throwing a ball over your head and having it go in. Getting a rebound and then the greatest shooter in NBA history hitting a shot that he's probably practiced 10,000, 100,000 times, that's not luck. It's called making a play. Now, a lot of things had to go right for Miami to win, um, but it did, and they made the plays that they needed to to win that game six and then get to game seven. Um, to me, I think that LeBron and Wade and everybody in Miami is manufacturing something. They're motivated enough by a three-peat for the opportunity to join Michael. You know, Michael Jordan as a three-peat, Kobe and Shaq as a three-peat. There's enough motivation in that itself that you don't have to worry about what somebody else is saying on the outside. If it gives you an extra 1%, maybe. But to be honest, if, if they need anything to, more to be motivated, which I don't think they do, I think their mind's in the wrong place to begin with. I think it's much ado about nothing to chatter back and forth, to be completely honest with you. All right, so I, I, I believe that this series will be very entertaining. Mm -hmm. Though, I also feel like when it comes to the finals, there's always going to be one or two games that aren't going to be really competitive. Um, yep. And, and, you know, I don't know why that happens. It, you know, it, it just seems like there's one or two games where it's a blowout either way, and then the other games are, are super competitive. And I can definitely see that happening here, you know, and it all depends on the shooting. I, I think if, if one team gets hot and the other isn't, then that, it could definitely go that way. But I do think it's going to be competitive. I think it's going to be exciting. I think these are the right two teams in the finals. You know, people like to remember the Spurs of 2004 and say, oh, the Spurs are boring. You need to watch basketball in 2014 <laughs> because these guys move the basketball like nobody else. They get open shots. You know, like I was talking about Parker, Parker doesn't depend on outside shooting. You know, he's constantly attacking and getting to the rim and, and the guy can barely even jump, but he's so creative around the basket you know, with the types of layups and the, and the body angles that he uses. And, at the end of the day, uh, I think it's going to be close. You know, it's going to go six or seven games. I know where you're leaning. I, I can feel it in, <laughs> in the in the uh, in, in your voice. Um, I know that you know you, you compared uh, LeBron to Michael, and you know Michael didn't lose in, in the finals. LeBron has lost twice, but. You know, that first time it, it was against these Spurs when he was just a pup and it really wasn't, uh, you know, it really wasn't uh, competitive uh, from a team perspective. But, you know, he's 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 trying to make up for lost time here. And if there is a guy who can will, you know, will this will his team to, to win a championship, I think it is LeBron. He, he's, he's the best player in the game. I feel like San Antonio has the edge uh, in the Tony Parker thing that I was talking about, and I don't think that I think that I think they're playing a little bit of possum with him. I think this is a little bit of gamesmanship. While I truly believe that all of these guys are probably dinged up, um, you know, just with today's medicine, just with how these guys, uh, the trainers, take care of these guys. You know, is Tony Parker's hamstring going to be 100%? Probably not. But I think he will be good enough to be the X factor like I talked about. And I have the Spurs winning this thing in seven. Um, I, I I like Miami much better, though. I'm a much bigger LeBron fan than, than anybody uh, this side of, you know, players on the Warriors team. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going to go I'm going to go with the Spurs just on the Tony Parker X factor. You're going with the Heat. I'm going to imagine. How many games? I'm going to go with the Heat in six. 
and while I, I, I would want to say he's in seven, I have, a, I have a hard time imagining him winning a game seven in San Antonio, um, just generally with the way game sevens work in basketball, not in hockey, but in basketball. Uh, the way game, seven, game sevens work, generally it seems like the home team has, has a large advantage. Um, when, when I look at this series, I think both teams are pretty comparable um, you know, San Antonio gets a lot of credit for their ball movement and their team, um, the way that they play together. But a lot, a lot of that same thing can be said for for Miami. It gets a little more um, shadowed out because LeBron is such a huge figure. But these two teams, to me, are the two best passing teams, the two best, you know, run teams in terms of coaching. Um, they have clear ideas. They have clear sets. They know what they're going to do. And the talent gap, I don't think, is very big either way, to be completely honest with you. So when I when I split hairs, and I try to be as 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 neutral as possible, but when I look at these two teams, I see pretty even teams. And so for me, I always go with the best player. If you look at the teams that have won the NBA championship over the last, you know, let's say twenty something years, there's a couple of outliers, but in reality, it's usually the team with the best player. The only times I can remember off the top of my head, GG that the team of the best player did not win the championship. You could say 2011 with the Mavericks over the Heat. You could say, you could argue 2008 with the Celtics over the Lakers, because I think Kobe was probably the best player in that series. And maybe 2004 with the Pistons over the Lakers, you could say Kobe and Shaq were better than the whole Pistons team, but the Pistons overall probably had a better team. But generally, you know, really the be- the, the best player – as long as the teams are fairly close, they generally win. And there will be blowouts. Three out of the seven games last year between these two teams were won by more than 15 points. Three out of seven games. Two for San Antonio, one for Miami. So we're going to see a couple of those games. But the ones that it comes down to are those close games, and I will always take the best player in close games over the, the, the team concept in close games. So for me, that's why I see Miami winning. Now, all this is predicated on Miami really holding serve at home because they're going to have to win at least one game in San Antonio if they want to close it out in six. And it would be really tough for them to go to a seventh game and win, but I do see Miami winning in six. And, but, but honestly, I think this is, if this series could be half as good as last year's NBA Finals, we're going to be in for an absolute treat because last year's Finals was one of the best you'll ever see. Um, I'm really looking forward to it, but I do see Miami in six. So the way you're saying this is probably they have to split in San Antonio, win both at home, and then they would have to win game six uh, at home, and that would be the way that they do it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's probably the most likely scenario. Now, the only other scenario is this. They split in San Antonio, they split in Miami, and then everything rides on that that game five. Now, if Miami's able to get game five in San Antonio, they win the series in six. They're 10 and 0 in the big three area and close out games at home. And while that's not necessarily applicable to this series, you see that they win games at home when they have the chance to win a series. I can't see them going, going, being down 3 2 into game five and coming back and winning the series. That's a tall, that's a tall order to have. So the best case scenario for them is to get a split, win both at home, and then find a way to win one out of three, most likely game six at home. But I think that if, if they go into a game five, Miami's always been able to, in this big three era, with the exception of the 2011 finals against Dallas, win the games they have to win. And that's why I feel comfortable with this team winning the championship this season. But honestly, of all the series I picked the last couple of years, this was the hardest one for me to feel confident in, and I went with Miami just because they have the best player. But it really could go either way. Either way, but they really need to get one of these first two in San Antonio. All right, man. Well, it starts on Thursday, and I will be glued to the television like I imagine you will. And I'm actually at mm-hmm. work. I'm, I'm in the office tomorrow, and I'm hoping that ABC.com – will play the game <laughs> because they they stream the, you know basically all of their 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 uh, programs and I hope there's not some weird deal where you know you can't uh-huh. you can't see it or or maybe ESPN 3 will stream or something 
so that we can uh, we can watch it because we we have a projector and we'll put the we'll hook up the laptop to the big projector and bring down the big screen and you know you're you're talking about like a a hundred uh, a hundred inch TV kind of screen watching the game so that's my hope uh, be watching it while I work uh, work in the evening. But um, yeah, I'm with you. I think this is going to be uh, really great stuff. Looking forward to it. The NBA, for my money, the NBA is my favorite league. Though you know, my Gi- my Giants fans buddies will probably scoff at that because baseball fa- <laughs> baseball fans are a little bit snobby in general. But um, yeah, they'll be very mad that I said that. Uh, but yeah, give me the NBA over anything else, and and I'm happy. So um, yeah, th- don't tell NHL guy that. Oh uh, yeah, that's enough. But the, you know, the, 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 I, I I look at NHL fan as like pro wrestling fan in that they are such a hardcore vocal yeah. minority that they seem bigger than they are, but they're really not that big. <laughs> but um, but no, I mean, how can you how can you hate on the NHL? They they constantly produce every postseason, so I'm not I'm not mad at them at all. But they are definitely uh, fourth when it comes to that stuff. Um, all right, yo, thank, thanks for hanging out, dude. We we went much longer than I expected to uh, to have you, but I appreciate you. I appreciate you chiming in, and we had good discussions about stuff. And uh, you know, we'll have to do it again sometime. Pleasure is all mine, man. You get two smart people together, it always takes longer than you thought. <laughs> Maybe right. one smart guy, you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. You're the you're the one who's in the biz, my friend. I just do this for fun. Um, all right, for uh, for my buddy Twitch. AKA, and this is really hard for me to keep calling you this, Nick James on <laughs> ESPN 630. You can listen to him. You're on 3 to 5 Pacific time, right? 3 to 5 Monday through Friday, and we put the podcast up every day after the show. I will, Except today, I forgot to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will link to the page where you can listen to Nick, uh, like talk, Nick talk about sports. Um, and also, if you want to follow him on Twitter, he is at NickJames21. I imagine that was like your basketball number or something. That was what uh, the young Randall passed on down to his favorite player, honestly. <laughs> awesome. Cause, yeah, because that's Randy's basketball number, right? Yep. He gave me the jersey. He told me. I was like, Coach, I never wore 21 before. He's like, don't worry about it. Just wear it. Later on, he told me it was his number. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So for for uh, for Twitch aka Nick James, I'm Double G. We will see you when we see you. Peace out.